scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, what a year this week has been. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we do sing and we pray that you would be our vision. You are the high king of heaven. Our victory is won. And we want to ask that you would inform all things. We want you to be Lord of all. And we need your help to that end. We need to be consumed with the good news of Jesus, the grace that you've shown us, though we don't deserve it, that we would respond wanting to bless you at all times, so that your praise would be continually in our mouths, that our soul would make its boast in you, our Lord. May we be humble and may we be glad and may we magnify the Lord. May we exalt your name together. As we seek you, would you answer us and would you deliver us from all of our fears? Would we look to you and be radiant? Our face is never ashamed. Would we taste and see that you are good? May we believe that blessed, happy is the man who takes his refuge in you. May we believe that the saints who fear you lack no good thing. God, as we think about our country, we pray for it in some ways this week. We don't even know how to pray, but we do pray for one thing in particular, regardless of what the week looks like, the month looks like, the year looks like, the next four years look like. We pray in particular this morning for religious liberty. God, we pray for leaders to value it. Pray that regardless, locally, state, national, whoever's in charge, we pray that they would value and protect religious liberty. And we pray that you would keep their hands out of your church, that we might continue to do what you've called us to do freely. We're grateful for the freedom we have, and we pray and we ask that you would preserve it. And may we be reminded, as Nebuchadnezzar was when he was humbled, that your dominion is an everlasting dominion. Your kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and you do according to your will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay your hand or say to you, what have you done? We trust you. Pray in Christ's name, amen. Why is life so hard? Why is there so much pain, and toil, trials, heartache, heartbreak? Why is life filled with conflict? Why are feelings always hurt? Why is marriage so challenging? Why is divorce so common? Why is it so rare to see not only marriages that survive, but marriages that thrive? Well, this morning's passage is going to explain why the world is cursed. We've been walking through Genesis 1 to 3 and we're nearing the end of our journey and we're in this context of the curses of sin. And I've said this a few times and I want to say it again as we've walked through Genesis and laid so much foundations that God's way is best, God's way is clear, but God's way is countercultural, increasingly so. The most dangerous worldview is the one that we don't even realize we've imbibed. And so this morning, if God's word rubs you the wrong way, and it likely will, we just need to, we just need to agree that the problem's not here, the problem's here. And so let us have this humble posture towards God's word that affirms he is the boss. 
He is the creator. He knows best and his way is best, regardless of what contemporary culture thinks about it. So we've already started this context of the curses. Last week in verse 14 and 15, we saw the curses on Satan. That there would be this ongoing enmity between the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. We saw good news there. High king of heaven, my victory is won. The offspring of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, defeat evil. And so we saw that. Now we will see now how the, how the fall affects us and specifically affects man and woman. So let's look first at sin's consequences for the woman. It's right there in Genesis 3.16. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. So because of sin, women will have pain in childbearing. And every mom says, amen. And the focus here, I think, is on physical pain. But I think it involves all the pain involved. In, in a fallen world, the physical and the emotional are both problematic, right? I think it's physical pain and emotional pain. But again, those two can be tied, right? Consider hormones. <laughs> Alicia battles postpartum every birth, and she just knows it's coming. And so the, the first three months after having a baby, she just knows, here it comes. I've got to fight as my emotions and hormones and everything get back and balance after giving giving and forming life. That's quite a feat the female body does. And so hormones play a part with the physical as well. So the physical and emotional, it's challenging. Pain and childbearing. It's a, I think it's shorthand for the whole deal, the whole process. It's hard. It's challenging. Just consider menstruation, barrenness, miscarriage, stillbirths, morning sickness, Cramps, discomfort, lack of sleep, back pain. I left one out and one of our ladies who may or may not be over the age of 40 said, you forgot hot flashes. <laughs> Long labors. And giving birth is extremely dangerous. Mrs. White was a labor and delivery nurse when we first got married. And so she had vowed never to do a home birth. She had just seen too much. It's scary stuff. It's not the way it's supposed to be. In fact, really, in this fallen world, every healthy delivery, healthy baby, healthy mom, it really is a miracle. And there's the pain of not being able to get pregnant. Infertility is a major trial. And it doesn't get much more painful than miscarriages and stillborn babies. And around 15%, it's a lot, around 15% of pregnancies end in miscarriage. It's incredibly painful. It's not the way it's supposed to be. The world is broken. I think pain in childbirth also encompasses the whole emotional toil of being a mom. It's incredibly hard work and kids can go astray and kids can get sick. The whole task is a challenge because of sin. What God intended to be pure blessing is now tainted with sin, tainted with sorrow because of sin. So it's glorious, but the entire process is mixed with sorrow east of Eden, pain and childbearing. So right, right away, we see that because of the consequences of sin, the woman is affected as mom. But as we keep reading, she's also affected as wife. Look at the middle of verse 16. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So what does this mean? Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, or maybe your translation says against your husband. What does that mean? Specifically, what does that word desire mean? Well, anytime we want to find out the meaning of a word, first we just look at it in context, and it could mean a few things. And so we look at how this word's used in other contexts in the Bible. And this particular word is actually only used three times in the whole Old Testament, right here in Genesis 3.16. And then another time in Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10, but there it's a positive desire. It's a sexual desire, actually. And so some commentators think that that's what it means here in Genesis 3, 16. You'll have sexual desire for your husband, but that really doesn't fit the, the context, right? This is, this is a negative desire, right? Just think about if it, was a, if it was a positive view. Because of sin, you'll have 
pain and childbearing and you will sexually desire a husband. That, that doesn't make sense to have a positive desire in this context. So that doesn't really help us out with Song of Solomon. So what else? Well, that other third usage is actually right here in the immediate context, just like 15 verses away. It means we ought to pay attention. So look with me. It's in Genesis 4-7. I'm going to read 5 to 7 to give us a feel, but pay attention to the phrase in verse 7. Same word, very similar phrase to help us out. Genesis 4, verse 5. But for Cain and his offering, God had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. This is really helpful in understanding what Genesis 3.16 means, right? The rule of interpretation is the same as the rule of real estate. Context, context, context. And so we get help here. And notice what's going on in Genesis 4. Sin is crouching at the door and sin wants to dominate Cain. Its desire is to take over Cain. Sin wants to rule over Cain, to have its way with Cain. And so that helps us understand what Genesis 3.16 means. As a result of the fall, the wife will be tempted to desire against the husband, to dominate the man, to rule over the man, to have her way with the man, to usurp his leadership. And so this parallel verse helps us see what kind of temptation it'll be. Because of sin, the woman's desire will be to control and dominate and overpower and subdue and usurp her husband's God-given authority. Where before the fall, this conflict didn't exist. She would joyfully follow his God-centered leadership. I think the New Living Translation, which is kind of a paraphrase, it gets it right on this verse. It translates 316 like this. You will desire to control your husband. And so this right here is why people think submission and authority are four-letter words. Starts right here. Ladies, this is why you sometimes find it hard to follow your man. Because of sin, your desire will be against him. So tying these two together, the first half of 16 and the second half of 16, we see that because of the fall, the woman is challenged at the core of her femininity as wife and as mother. These are her fundamental domains. These are her principal responsibilities where her chief orientation is to be right there in 316A, mom, 316B, wife. The core of who you are is now hard because of the fall. And so ladies, how should you respond to this, this curse, this fallenness? Well, first, no shame in epidurals. Fight the curse with everything you can. Second, realize, realize this fallen tendency started in the garden, this fallen tendency to want to dominate your husband. Realize it and then fight against it. Know that when you want to push back and you want to undermine or jab or, or lead over, realize that can be tainted by sin. And on the flip side, embrace the biblical teaching on submission. In fact, don't just embrace it, gladly embrace it. Isn't that what we want? That's what we want for mature Christians of all things, not just this type of teaching, all teaching of scripture. We want to have a glad embrace of whatever God says. And I realize, I, I sound like a dinosaur up here right now. I realize how countercultural this is. So let me just read some verses. I didn't write them out, I'm just delivering it. It's important to know, ladies, though, married women in particular, those who want to be married, everywhere a wife is mentioned in the New Testament, there's the call to submission. Let me just read them. 1 Peter 3, 1. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. 1 Peter 3, 5. This is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, by the way, this is really important because this call is first and foremost between you and the Lord before it is that man. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Colossians 3.18, wives 
submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. If right now, ladies, you feel in, in you this like angst and this anger towards me, don't be mad at me. I didn't, I'm just right here. It's, it's right here. Go to the text. But if you feel this like, realize it's because of Genesis 3.16. It's because of the fall that we buck against God's authority, which shows itself here in a call for husbands to lead wives. Titus chapter 2, verse 5, older women should teach younger women what? To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God might not be reviled. And so again, Christian maturity is when we don't buck against God's word, but we gladly embrace it. And if there's something wrong, we realize it must be here, not here. And so gladly embracing and then doing everything you can by grace through faith to obey them. But here's what we learn. It won't be easy because of sin. Challenges as a mom, challenges as a wife. What about sin's consequences for man? Look at, again, there in the middle of 16. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he, will, he shall rule over you. So notice first that fallen man will be tempted to harsh leadership. He will rule over you. The Bible teaches loving male headship, not male domination. But here we learn as the wife seeks to dominate him, his tendency will be to react in a harsh manner. As one commentator put it, the husband's rightful authority would become a tyrannical mastery over a wife trying to dominate him. And so the woman at her worst will oppose his leadership and the man at his worst would harshly respond to his wife. Now this actually is a battlegrounds uh, of interpretation within the church. So this very verse, and you college kids in particular, I want you to know this. I've mentioned before there are really two camps within the church when it comes to gender roles. There are egalitarians, and egalitarians teach that men and women were created equal, therefore have zero distinction. No distinction of roles in the home or the church. That's the majority of you today. That's the majority of you in Abilene. That's certainly the majority of you in Christian colleges. You just need to know, though, it was not the majority of you for 2,000 years of church history. It's a new view. We are, and all Southern Baptists are, at least on paper, complementarian. So we believe that man and woman created equal, equal in essence, both created in the image of God with distinctive roles. Very clearly taught in Scripture, distinctive roles in the church and in the home. This verse becomes a battleground because what egalitarians say is all that male headship, male leadership stuff, that's just a result of sin. That's a result of the fall. It wasn't supposed to be that way. Complementarians teach that male leadership and male headship was God's will before the fall, his creative will, his created order, as well as after the fall. And this verse becomes really important because they would say, see, this is just part of sin, but I need to show you and I need you to get that male leadership was God's will before sin entered the world. I'm going to give you 12 reasons why. Number one, male headship was God's will before sin. Make a case here. This is building on Wayne Grudem and, and Bruce Ware and a few others. Number one, Adam was formed first. God created Adam and then he created Eve. He could have created at the same time. He could have done whatever he wanted. You may say, well, that's not a big deal. Listen to what the New Testament teaches us about this order. In 1 Timothy 2, which is on the context of male leadership in the local church, he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she's to remain quiet. For, here's the reason, because Adam was formed first, then Eve. Number two. Eve was formed from Adam. Remember, Adam was formed from the dirt. Remember, God could have made Adam and Eve from the dirt. He could have done whatever he wanted, but he, he forms Adam and then Eve from Adam. And again, the New Testament helps us draw this out. Listen to 1 Corinthians 11. Man is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So this created order matters. Number three, God created Eve to be Adam's helper. We saw that in Genesis chapter two, verse 18, that Adam was alone. He could not fulfill the mission. And so God creates a helper fit for him. Number four, God names the whole human race man. 
Adam, Adam in Hebrew. Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then in Genesis 5.2, male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. So man is the representative of mankind. Number five, the man named the woman. In fact, he names, them two time, names her two times. First as woman, Isha from Ish. And then we'll see next week, he names her Eve. And in the ancient Near East, naming entails authority. And so the one who names is the one who leads. Number six, God gave the commands to Adam. Again, he could have waited until Eve was created. But in God's order of things, he creates the man and instructs him And then he was to instruct her with God's word, God's commands. Number seven, the serpent deceived Eve and specifically deceived her into taking leadership over Adam. Remember what we've seen, we're really just summarizing what we've seen over the last 10 weeks. God's structure was like this. God formed the man, put him in the garden, spoke to the man, made the woman from the man for the man. Well, the serpent comes in and hates God and hates authority and hates God's authority. And what does he do? Rather than the man leading the woman and both of them having dominion over the created order, what do we see? The created order comes and has dominion over them. The serpent goes to the woman, not the man. He's reversing the structure. And she, she then speaks to the serpent rather than the man or the Lord. And she eats the fruit and then leads him to eat the fruit. And so the deception was reversing God's created order. And again, 1 Timothy 2, where Paul's teaching about leadership in the church, he finds this significant. Listen again to 1 Timothy 2. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she's to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So again, the New Testament is showing these verses matter. Adam sinned knowingly and willingly. Eve was deceived. Number eight, God holds Adam primarily responsible. Who ate the fruit? Who gave the fruit to Adam? But notice who God goes after. Look at Genesis 3 verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Masculine singular pronoun. If egalitarianism were true, you'd think he'd go to the woman or at least the woman and the man. But no, God goes to the man because he was ultimately responsible as leader. Of course, later, the book of Romans tells us sin entered the world by one man. doesn't say one woman. He holds Adam primarily responsible. Number nine. God's language is in the curse that we're going to see here shows that male headship was the norm before the fall. Notice what he says in verse 17. He doesn't tell Adam, well, you disobeyed me or you ate the fruit. Notice what he says. He says, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, you followed her leadership, which led to disobeying God. Number 10, the nature of these curses teaches male headship was before the fall. We've seen here the woman as helper, as wife and mom, and the man we'll see as provider and protector. Number 11, med- male headship is reaffirmed in the New Testament. So remember the logic here. Egalitarianism said this was pre-fall, this was because of the fall. Well, if male headship was a result of the fall, it would not be reaffirmed in the New Testament. But instead, it's God's will before the fall. The fall messes it all up, but it's reaffirmed in the New Testament in passages that we've just seen, Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 and Titus 2 and 1 Peter 3. Here's how one author puts it. Christian redemption does not redefine creation. It restores creation. Here's how John Piper and Wayne Grudem put it. The Bible reveals the nature of masculinity and femininity by describing diverse responsibilities for man and woman while rooting these differing responsibilities in creation, not convention. That's really important because the argument you'll hear, oh, this submission stuff, that was just for then. Now we know 
But the problem is again and again, we have this teaching rooted not in first century culture, but in the created order. Number 12, the Christ church parallel. So male leadership ultimately is important for what marriage points to. Remember that marriage is just a display. It's just an advertisement of what? Christ and the church. It's Ephesians 5. So Christ is the head of the church. The husband is the head of the wife. A wife is to submit to her husband as the church submits to Christ. And then in Ephesians 5.33, he quotes Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, this created order. And he, he quotes it and says, The man, therefore, shall leave his father and his mother and father and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then Paul says, This print mystery is profound, and I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. So the whole point of marriage, husband and wife, is to point point to Christ and the church. And hear this, church. Christ does not submit to the church. The church submits to Christ ever and always. So complementarianism is right. Very unpopular, but right. Male headship is taught before the fall, but now it's all messed up. There's all kinds of dangers and potentials for sin hard the wife will desire to rule him and he's going to respond in harsh rule really right here in Genesis 3 16 we have the beginning of the battle of the sexes to love and to cherish becomes to desire and to dominate and so first sin affects the man as a husband and the temptation to be harsh when he leads but on the opposite side of that sin makes men passive that's really the two polar opposites, the way men are tempted to sin. What will it be? Will it be harshness or will it be passivity? It needs to be neither. The temptation will be abuse or abdication. And that's what we see here with Adam as he abdicates, right? Look again at chapter 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Remember, it wasn't like he was off and away and comes home to that forbidden fruit casserole. He's right there. Passive as a windsock. And you that's what we call lily livered. He abdicates. He doesn't lead. Again, verse 17, because you listened to the voice of your wife, you didn't honor God. You followed her to dishonor God. He followed her initiative in that case. So the fall is not just rebellion against God, but it's the setting aside of the divinely appointed order for male and female, which is why it's so unpopular today. And I submit it's why marriages are struggling. God knows what he's doing. Marriages flourish when we live his way. And because of the fall, the world is filled with either abusive men or here in this context with Adam, passive men who often beget passive men. And just look at our cultural portrayal of masculinity. Look at the dad you see on television. You got your family guy. You got your Homer Simpson. You got your modern family. Fumbling, bumbling, incompetent buffoons who are acted upon rather than active. And let me just say, Men of Southside Baptist Church, you're breaking the mold. And it is so encouraging. I hear again and again and again of solid, sacrificial male leadership who are seeking to lead the family to the throne of God and God's at work. Doug Wilson defines masculinity as the glad assumption of sacrificial responsibility. I love every word in that definition. The glad assumption of sacrificial responsibility. Man, God has invested us with authority and that authority is built so that those under that authority flourish. First in, last out, laughing the loudest. Biblically, men are called to lead, love, provide, and protect. To lead, 
to take initiative, to have a vision and to have a mission and to know where you're going, to be decisive and clear-headed and warm-hearted and thick-skinned and committed to the glory of God in everything you do. The, the solution to harsh male leadership is not no leadership. It's biblical male headship, which has the shape of Calvary, the cross. So men need to lead, to take initiative, to be responsible, to have nothing to do with blame shifting. Unlike Adam, our dad, our father, right? Look at chapter 3, verse 12. Well, how does he handle his sin? Does he own it? Does he confess it and turn from it? Verse 12, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? Sorry, verse 12, that was 13. Verse 12, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. It's her fault. Nathan said, ultimately, he says, God, it's your fault. No, a refusal to make excuses is the heart of biblical masculinity. Reject blame shifting. Reject passivity. Avoid abdication. Have ownership. Don't pass the buck. Anytime the buck is passed, it's passed with a limp wrist. The flip side of God's call here for wives to submit is for men to lead and be men worth following. So men, pursue Christ first and foremost. Die to self. Invest in your family, not your hobbies. Work hard. Kill sin. And if you do this as best you can, again, by grace through faith, repenting all the way, your wife will gladly follow you. So be men worth following. Lead out. Make decisions. Talk it out. Hear from your wife. Get her wisdom and counsel. Get the counsel of others. Take it seriously. But at the end of the day, the responsibility lies with you. So we lead and we love. We lay down our lives, right? Ephesians 5, 25, what's the call? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. It's Calvary shaped. It's giving, not getting and receiving. That's not biblical headship. Headship is one that gives away for the good of others with your actions and with your words. Tell them, tell them all the time. I think it's a little bit generational, but let's be, let's be rid of the men who don't regularly tell their families how much they love them. Every day, tell your wife, tell your children how much you love them. Give them understanding. Give them attention. Quality time is quantity time. Give them affirmation. Give them affection. Continue to get to know your wife, date her, pursue her, romance her, affirm your sons. They should have no doubt about how you feel about them. Regularly tell them how proud you are of them. Adore your daughters. Lavish on the affection. She should never feel average around you, dad. And you know how to keep your daughter from hopping in some lap of some young man as a teenager? Keep her in your lap when she's a little girl. Lavish the affection. We lead and we love and we provide. Provide from this Latin word pro, before, video, see, vision. So we provide. We see beforehand. We foresee and we act with foresight. That's what it means to provide. And sin affects the man as leader, but also it affects him as provider. So we see in verses 17 to 19, the ground is cursed, thorns and thistles, sweat. Because of the fall, man's work will be frustrated hard, often unfulfilling. And because of that universal experience, oftentimes we tend to think, well, work is, work is cursed itself. Work is sin. Work is a bad thing. But remember, God called us to work long before the sin. He created us to work. Genesis 128, to rule and subdue. Chapter 2, verse 15, to work and keep the garden. It's not that work is cursed in these verses. It's that the ground is cursed. This is why everything's always going wrong. This is why work is hard. This is why there's unreasonable expectations. This is why there's difficult bosses. This is why it can be so exhausting. This is why a small project takes three trips to Lowe's. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 1.8, all things are full of weariness. But men are called to provide, provide for their families. And 1 Timothy says that if we don't, we're worse than an unbeliever. This is a call, lead, love, provide. And so view your work through this lens. You're providing. 
You're having dominion. You're subduing the, the world for the good of your neighbor, for the provision of your family, and ultimately for the glory of God. We lead, we love, we provide, but we also protect those under our care. Women and children in the boat first, always. We protect physically, but we also protect spiritually. And here again, this is where Adam failed. Adam was called to guard the garden. That snake should have never entered. There should have been no deception. Shouldn't even have been a possibility. Instead, he lets her in and the lies begin and ultimately we have the fall. Well, men are called to protect their homes from spiritual harm. Some of you guys, you have scrupulous dominion over the physical temperature of your home. You just looked at your app all ago. But no clue about the spiritual temperature of your home. And remember, especially in the church, the enemy is rarely explicit. He's often subtle. And so men, what influences are you allowing into your home? Ephesians 6.4, fathers, bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We bear the responsibility. Because of the fall, we see ultimately sweat, labor, frustration, thorns, thistles, and ultimately death. We're going to return to the ground. Genesis 3.19 says, we are dust to dust, we shall return. Sad ending to our series in Genesis. Man called to subdue the earth and ultimately the earth will subdue mankind. Mankind called to rule over the earth and ultimately now the earth is going to rule over us six feet under. Us called to cultivate the earth and we end up fertilizing the earth. So much for becoming like God. The serpent lied as he does. He promised benefits from disobedience, which is never true. And it adversely affects man and woman in our respective responsibilities, our fundamental domains. There will be frustrations with fruitfulness. The man with the ground and the woman with childbearing. Here's how Bill Mauser puts it. He says, Adam is cursed at the place where his manliness was to shine in cultivating the earth. Woman is cursed at the place where her womanliness was to shine in bringing new life into the world and in her helping roles toward her husband. Again, what was meant to be a source of blessing is now tainted and frustrated by the curse. This is why life is hard. Sin ruins everything. I mean, look what we've seen. It ruins the personal. It ruins the spiritual, obviously. It ruins the social. It ruins the emotional. It ruins the physical. Life is not the way it's supposed to be, and this is the reason why. But we're pretty early on in this book. The way a lot of people like to summarize the whole story of the scripture is creation, fall, redemption, new creation. And so we've seen creation, we've seen fall. We've also already had a little hint of redemption. The offspring of the woman will come and defeat the serpents. And now we await new creation. Redemption has begun with the cross and resurrection really before that. And now here we are. The ground is cursed and it's cursed with thorns and thistles, a very tangible reminder of the fallenness of the world. How fitting then that our king wore a crown, not of gold or rubies, but made of thorns. And so we sing, see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did ever such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown. Through his death and resurrection, the new and better Adam is reversing the curse. It's already begun. And we've been freed. We've been delivered. We've been forgiven. No condemnation. And now we can work with all of our might for his glory as we await that day when the curse will be fully reversed. That day, as the last book of the Bible says, no longer will anything be accursed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Let's pray. Father, once again, we're thankful for the clarity of your word, even if unpopular, but also the relevance. And we see here the vision of the good life. And I'm so thankful for so many marriages in Southside that we see this embodied and are flourishing. 
Pray for our women, that you would continue to conform them to the image of Jesus, that they would seek to follow you, that they would seek to follow their husbands and be affirming and encouraging and not tearing down or domineering. We pray for the men in here whose tendency is to be domineering and abusive. Would you convict them of sin here and now? If there's any physical abuse, may it stop immediately. May the authorities be consulted. If there's harsh language, may repentance be granted. If there's passivity, God, would you give the men whose tendency is that way power, courage, vision that they would seek to die to self and lead the family in such a way that honors you in all things. God, as we step back, we see that the world is broken. Things aren't the way it's supposed to be. We're reminded afresh of that. Why? Because of ultimately the sin of Adam, but also our own sin that comes as soon as we're able to. And it makes us hopeful for the day when you come. Creation, redemption has begun. Because of the fall, now we wait new creation. Would you help us? Because of what you've done through Christ, because the victory's been won, would we sing loud and would we live hard for the sake of the King? We prayed in his name. Amen.